This morning there was a knock on the door and it was the postman with a package and it contained this. This is a Stuart Models 10V steam engine and it's very well packed indeed. It's come from a customer who asked me to have a look at it because he says it doesn't run very well and when it is running it makes a knocking noise. So I'm very carefully unpacking the engine and when all the bubble wrap is removed this is what I have to look at and it looks very nice indeed. Very, very well presented. All the parts externally are very accurately machined. There's a little oil in places to stop it from rusting. But yes, it looks really nice. I can't understand why it's not running properly. I received a covering note from the customer, so I have a good idea what he's talking about. And the first thing to do is to put a piece of board down on the bench. One major problem with Stuart 10 V engines is that the flywheel is slightly too large in my opinion and it hangs down below the level of the box bed. So if you put the engine on the bench, what happens is the flywheel bottoms on the bench, and if you were to run it, it would go around in a circle. But what usually happens with this arrangement is that the crankshaft gets bent. The crankshaft is only 9 30 seconds of an inch in diameter, so it's not exactly very strong. So if you inadvertently bang the engine down onto the bench, the flywheel bottoms first and bends the crankshaft. But there's no danger of me doing that because I know about this so I'm putting it on a piece of board and the flywheel is now suspended above the bench. The first thing to do is to lubricate the engine. I'm using my mixture of steam oil and rapeseed oil because it's a very good lubricant. For compressed air running the steam oil is far too thick and even for live steam running it's still a little bit thick for the bearings. Great for the cylinder, that's what it's designed to do. But by mixing it with this rapeseed oil, makes the steam oil more than adequate for lubricating bearings. Having a quick feel at the tolerances, the engine feels good. Let's see how it runs. And to my surprise, initially the engine is running much better than I thought it was going to do. Mainly because the customer had enclosed a covering letter which said that after a while the engine started knocking badly. But then he did mention that he was using machine oil or lathe spindle oil and this stuff is far too thin. It will spin away from the parts in no time at all, leaving them dry. So a good quality lubricating oil, not motor oil, but a good quality steam engine lubricating oil is recommended. But I just use my steam oil mixed with some rapeseed oil, and the viscosity is perfect, it clings nicely to the parts, and I never get any problems. Even though the engine appears to run quite well, I can hear there is a problem with the valve events. I will look at that very shortly. There is also some run out on the flywheel. The flywheel is not running true. But I'll have a look underneath the engine. Oh, and look what I've found. The crank webs are a little bit bizarre. They're all different sizes. And the end one, which is a very important one as it supports the crankshaft at the flywheel end, is far too thin. Something is definitely not right in the crankshaft department. Anyway, I'll live with that for the moment and I'll just check the tightness of the big end shells. And they're a little bit slack. So I'll just nip them up gently. The rest of this engine appears to be quite well made. If you look at the connecting rods, they're beautifully machined. The flywheel's well machined. And all the parts look good, but there's more to an engine than the way it looks externally. There is quite a bit of side play on the big ends on the crank pins. And this is not an issue because the big ends are not slapping against the crank webs. But as you can see clearly, the thin crank web doesn't really need to be thin, it could be the normal size. I don't really know what's transpired here. But to be perfectly honest, I'm more concerned about the sound of the valve events. The valve's very wheezy. Just have a listen as I rotate the crankshaft with some compressed air going into the cylinder. If you listen carefully to the noise that the engine's making, you will hear that one of the valves admits an exhaust nice and cleanly with a bit of a chop, and the other one just wheezes at both ends of the stroke. For the moment, I'm just going to run the engine and see what happens, see if anything falls off it. I work on a great variety of different sized steam engines, usually model steam engines, but sometimes small full-size ones. Taking a Stuart Models 5A as an example, this has quite generous proportions, whereas a Stuart 10V like this one has very small bearing surfaces, and they are prone to rattling a little bit. But having a small bearing surface is nothing to do with the valve events. 
so I'm removing the steam chest cover to have a look inside and see what the valve is doing. Oh, and by the way, I'm just checking what the colour of the oil is coming out of the cylinder. And it's a very good colour, which means that the engine appears to be quite well running. If the oil coming out of the cylinder was very black, it would show that the engine is still running in. But as this is a very clean brown colour, one assumes that the piston is a good fit and everything is as it should be. So I've been very careful not to lose any of the nuts. I removed the steam chest cover, and in the steam chest, of course, is the valve. Whilst I was adjusting the position of the valve relative to the valve spindle, I noticed that the gland nut was a very tight fit, and it took quite a lot of pressure to physically push the valve up and down inside the steam chest because of the tightness of this gland nut. So for the moment, I slackened it off. When I fully dismantle the valve rod, I will remove the gland nut at the same time and run a reamer through it to clean up the hole. By removing this cross pin from the valve fork which holds the valve fork to the eccentric rod, I can rotate the valve spindle which moves the valve up and down and allows me to get the valve in precisely the right position to allow accurate admission of the compressed air or steam to each side of the piston. The timing of the engine as I received it in the post was definitely well out, so I put the timing right. Then I refitted the steam chest cover and connected the compressed air supply. In this clip I'm checking the adjustment of the gland nut on the valve spindle just to make sure it's not too tight and it seems to be okay now. The engine is running a lot more evenly. There's still a wheeze on the valve though. I'm going to have another close look at this very shortly. So that's the valve timing set on one end of the engine. Now it's time to look at the other end. So as before, I remove the steam chest cover, which gives me access to the valve, being very careful not to lose any of these 7BA nuts. And once this is removed, I will get access to the valve itself inside the chest, exactly like I've just done at the other end, in fact. Luckily, the steam chest covers are coming away very easily and they're leaving the gasket intact, which is always a good thing. Before I started, I set the eccentrics to 90 degrees to the crankwebs, and when I look at this valve in this steam chest, the timing is perfect, so I just replace the steam chest cover. But there's still a problem at this other end. This really is where the wheezy valve is. It's time to completely take out the valve spindle, then I'll be able to remove the valve entirely and have a close look at it. Once the valve spindle is fully unscrewed, the valve and the crossbar will be left in the steam chest as you see here. And with the help of my small pair of surgical forceps, I can remove the valve and the crossbar. And once the valve and crossbar are out of the way, I can start to see what the problems are with this side of the engine. First of all, the valve, look at it, it's definitely wonky. This is no good at all. It needs to be perfectly square and perfectly equidistant all the way around. And here's one I prepared earlier. This is a properly machined Stuart valve, and you can see the difference. The one on the left is mine. The one on the right, that I've just taken away, is from this engine. The valve is not really the problem though, this is. Look at the state of the port face. Whoever's built this engine has drilled the cylinder wrong. Now, I can never understand this. If I was building an engine like this and I made such a mistake so that the drill came through the port face, I would immediately scrap the cylinder and get another one. All right, it's a small expense, but I certainly wouldn't carry on. There is no possible way I can get good valve events with valves that are shaped like this. However, having said all that, by very, very carefully adjusting the position of the valve, I do get the engine to run very well in the end. And don't forget the engine is sat on my soundboard. I always put the engine on a soundboard so I can hear any spurious knockings that are going on. When I lift the engine off the board, it runs quite smoothly and without a lot of noise. And as you can also see, it runs very slowly. And the oil is fairly thick, it's not machine oil. You can always make an engine run really slowly by squirting three in one machine oil at it. But this has got proper lubricating oil. After all is said and done, this engine is still going to blow slightly because the valve events are never going to be right with the ports being shaped the way they are. But I can get it to run well enough for a model steam engine. What I've also done is move the position of the flywheel and this small flywheel closer to the actual eccentric. That way there's less chance of bending the crankshaft and as you can see the run out on the main flywheel has more or less disappeared. I turned it round because I didn't like the ugly allen bolt sticking out at the end. The purpose of making this video is twofold. One is to show the owner of the engine 
what's actually wrong with it. And the other one is to show anyone who's interested what can go wrong with engines like this and to be very careful when you buy them from the auction site that we all know and love. Having said all that, it's still a very nice looking engine and most of it is very well made. And even though I wasn't supposed to really repair this engine, I thought it would do because it didn't really take long. But it would take a long time to remachine a new cylinder and fit it all back together and it is prohibitive from a cost point of view. Thanks for watching and I hope you found it useful.